people need to know about codependency. And when God gave us the Ten Commandments, the very first of the commandments was, you shall have no other gods before me. That's Exodus 20, verse 3. He knew if we were to be all that God created us to be, we would have to put first things first. Our relationship with him. To receive all that he planned for us, we're going to have to have the right priorities in order for him to bless our lives, and which is his desire, and to give us what he plans for us to do. Codependent relationships, however, violate the heart of God's first commandment. Any codependent relationship violates his heart for us. We allow someone else to take the place that God alone has. We, if we have a codependent relationship, it's a misplaced dependency. Therefore, you'll never experience God's peace, the peace that God promises to give us. He promises to give us a peace that passes all understanding. However, if we choose to entrust our lives to him and allow him to be our God, not, let, not allowing another person to be our God, then that means we are putting him first. We will experience his peace, and therefore we will have his blessing because we will have an intimate fellowship with him, and that fellowship begins to meet needs that we don't know we even have. We see the words from Luke 10, 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then we see in, this is 1 John three sixteen as well as John 3.16. I love the parallels. They're just called the, the 3.16s. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And then we see God so loved the world. Notice the, the aspect of love, which is a giving kind of love. Love the world God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the truth is, as we look at how God wants to bless our lives, give peace to our lives, we can think, oh, but this is a wonderful relationship I have with this other person. We, we can be excited about that relationship and and we think we're giving we, we think oh I am loving however at times we have a misplaced dependence and we'll get into what codependency really looks like let me give you a definition what is codependency it's describing originally this is in the 1970s I want to give you the background in the 1970s this term was coined describing the dysfunctional family of family members seeking to attempt to adapt to the destructive behavior of the alcoholic. It was in a, only an alcoholic setting. And here's this alcoholic who has family members. Let's say here's a wife. The co, by the way, is a prefix and it means with so codependent people today are dependent on another person to the point of being controlled or manipulated by that person you see this is this may be very helpful to you to hear codependency is 
a relationship addiction. A relationship addiction, just like alcoholism is an addiction. But in this case, it's a dependency on being needed. The co part is the with person, the with person, you know, with the dependent. Codependents are dependent are on being needed by a problematic person. Now, sometimes we've heard the term increasingly called the enabler. An enabler enables a person to continue on with the dysfunction that they have without drawing and maintaining boundaries. An enabler perpetuates another's destructive behaviors by protecting them from the painful consequences if they were to be found out. Let me give an example. Let's go back to the alcoholic time. Here is an alcoholic who has a hangover. I'm this man, and I'm going to make him a, it a man. A man has this horrible hangover. And he just says, I can't go to work. And he's telling his wife. So, as a dutiful wife, she feels very loyal to him by calling the boss. Oh, my husband has the flu. We think it's just maybe one of those 24-hour flus. We don't think it could be a 48-hour flu, but, you know, he just is too sick to come in. Oh, oh, okay, well, I understand. She is enabling him by lying for him so that he will not have the negative impact at work instead saying, well, my husband has a hangover. She's not going to do that. That's what happens many times in codependent relationships. It's covering up for the other person's dysfunction, trying to, quote unquote, help them out, but they're really not helping. Their help is not helpful. Does that make sense? The help is not helpful. In fact, uh, it's interesting, you look at Jeremiah to the, the second chapter. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living waters. They have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. At times, we can think we're doing something good, and we're not. We're thinking we can hold the water. No, it's a broken cistern. This is not... This is a broken kind of relationship. So codependency is many times not understood or seen because people just don't know what it is. You say, well, but I, 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 I've got to help this person out. You know, I, I, I can't, uh, I just think I've, I'm called to doing this. And, and okay, if I have to make them feel better and, or excuse, that, that just seems like a loyal thing to do. It's misplaced loyalty. Proverbs 24, 24 says, Whoever says to the guilty, you are innocent, will be cursed by people and denounced by nations. Do you understand? We're not to be part of a cover-up. We're not to change the truth. And yet in codependent relationships, that is typical. It's not calling a spade a spade. It's not calling out what is the problem. Now, sometimes when we hear dependency, typically when I think of dependency, I think of it as typically wrong. Uh, sounds like it's not good. Yet, I have determined, and this is me, I think the key to the Christian life is the word dependent. Some people think, oh, it's commitment of your life. Well, that's it, thinking that you've got something to commit that has value. How wonderful. Yes, I'm committed now. I'm a committed Christian to my church. Look what I can give financially, abilities, blah, blah, blah. Um, the surrendered life is very different. Jesus said, I'm the vine. 
here are the branches. If you abide in me, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Notice this. Then he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I remember seeing that as a new Christian. I was not raised with the Bible. I didn't have a biblical background. I was in a church. Bible was not taught at all. I did not know one scripture when I finally got into a different church. I was stunned. It was just like culture shock. It, it was like, what is this? Something I've never seen before. And yet, I would read certain passages and I thought, apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus saying that? I thought, well, but I can do da da da. And not pridefully or cock. I wasn't cocky. It just didn't make sense. But I was totally immature. I mean, I, I didn't, I was a baby Christian. In other words, if I am going to be grafted in, if I, if I am connected to Christ as a branch, he's the vine or he's the trunk of the tree. It's like, if you stay there, you're going to bear much fruit. So I want to say to you, if God should be speaking to you and to, to even evaluate your relationships or to help you evaluate other relationships, it can be amazing because the end result is bearing much more fruit that you would not be able to produce on your own. It is true, I could do other things without Christ, you know, instead of him saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. No, in the natural, we can do what we can do. But what about the supernatural that he would equip us to do? Do you see the difference? He will enable us to bear fruit that we could never bear, that we could never produce on our own. Actually, he's the one who produces the fruit. We just bear the fruit. So dependency is a reliance on something or someone for support or existence. You are to be dependent on the Lord. Dependency can be either negative or positive. Dependency is an underlying attempt to get an emotional need met. If I hear dependence, somebody has a dependency, or wh wh what are you thinking? If, when you hear dependency, give me a, a dependency on what? What do you typically think? Substance abuse. It could be alcohol. It could be crack. It could be, you know, heroin, whatever it is. That, I think, is actually the number one correlation. So there are objects that we can be dependent on. Alcohol, tobacco, cocaine, or pornography, or sex toys. See, those things change the brain chemistry. We don't have time for that. We have material on sexual addiction. We can explain that. That's not what we're talking about right now. But it's interesting because you, there is a true mood-altering effect of the sexual high, of the chemical high. Or for gambling, there are certain um, behaviors. There's extramarital, extramarital sex, gambling, uh, compulsive eating, perfectionism, workaholism, anorexia, bulimia. The, the, there are all kinds of behaviors where there can be a dependency. But those are not healthy. Now, here you can have it not just on objects, a dependency on objects or behaviors, but here it can be on people. There is a love addiction. Some people just love. They're in love with love. And it is, I mean, there, it's, some people say, I'm a hopeless romantic. And they get caught up in this euphoria of anything that has romantic love. But there's also the savior addiction. I feel great when I'm helping somebody. By the way, how many of you feel great when you're helping somebody? Raise your hands if you do. I do. 
At times I've tried to help people who say, I, but I don't want help. Right? That is interesting. When you think you are really helping somebody, but it's the little boy scout who's trying to help the little old woman across the street, and he gets her across, and then he says, Hunt, Sonny, leave me alone. I never wanted to cross the street in the first place. You know, sometimes we think we have a role that we really shouldn't have or don't have. Instead, we're to have in our human relationships something, in a way, you know, I think, well, that's kind of a formal word, interdependent relationship. What is that? That's a healthy, mutual, give and take where neither person looks to the other to meet each other's each and every need. There are times when it's like, but I need you to need me to meet your needs because that's what gives me validation. I need you to need me. I need you to want me to meet those needs. Second Corinthians 1 9 says, We felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. In other words, there are times when we must, got, we must quit relying on ourselves to meet our own needs, but to rely on God to be our need meter. He is de has designed himself to be our need meter. This is what it's, the, the Bible is clear about in Philippians 4.19. My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now, sometimes he will use other people. They'll be a part of the plan. But he's got to be the number one source. So what are common codependent relationships? Well, there can be a wife who's excessively helpless, sometimes by her choice, around her husband, and the husband needs his wife to stay helpless. It bolsters his ego. A child can be excessively pampered by a parent, and the parent needs the child to stay in need of pampering. This is the overprotective kind of parent not allowing the natural results of child rearing or child uh, development to take place where sometimes the child's going to be rejected and you have to learn to live in a real world. A friend can be excessively fixated on another friend and that person needs the friend to stay fixated. By the way, I, let me tell you, or, uh, years ago I, I learned something I thought, surely that can't be true. That can't be true. It would be when the alcoholic, after a, quite a period of time in this codependent home, he's the alcoholic, the family works on eggshells, the mom is trying to juggle everything, and she, you know, she's doing a great job of being the juggler, and then all of a sudden he gets sober. He's now sober. He's not, no longer dependent on alcohol. That's when the number one time when uh, uh, divorces occur. Divorce? I remember, again, years ago, what, what, how could that be? He's gotten healthy. It's because she's unhealthy, because she has her identity in being the fixer. Does this make sense? And now she's just lost her role. She's just lost her identity. She's no longer the fixer because he's not needing fixing. And he's, she's upset with him because the dynamic has changed. This can be where a victim is excessively vulnerable to a victimizer. And the victimizer needs the victim to stay vulnerable. This is where at times it can be dangerous when the dynamic changes, the anger toward the victim who decides, 
I am not going to stay being used anymore. I am going to get out of this. I'm going to change my neediness on this person who's my perpetrator. Well, that is right to do. But just know, this can so upset the other person's sense of, you owe me. Look what I have done to you. And then all the shaming and the, the terrible language that occurs. In a codependent relationship, one is perceived as weak and the other is perceived as strong. Now, one could be weak, but what's so interesting, the weak one appears dependent on the strong one, but the one appearing strong is actually weak because of the need to be needed by the weak one. The weak person has a deep-seated need for security and looks to the strong one to meet all their needs. The strong one has a need for significance and tries to meet all the weak one's needs. It's a lock and a key. A lock and a key. At times you can be in a relationship where there's a fit of a lock and a key. If there's a lock and a key and you're the lock, guess what needs to change? You need to change so that the combination no longer fits because it's not godly. The dependence is letting another person be your God. In other words, that person has way too much control of your life. So what is the solution? God's solution for both is not to draw their strength in a dysfunctional way from each other, but rather to draw their strength from God. The Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. He needs to be our strength. I never will forget years ago when I was learning about codependency. And I had been in a codependent relationship. I didn't even know what that meant. I, I, I didn't even know the word. And um, I just thought, what, what's going on here? What's, what's happening here? And, and what, what I remembered that so truly ministered to me, it was the Jonathan and David relationship. Jonathan and David, here you've got David being assailed by the father of his best friend. And, and he, his life is threatened. And so Jonathan is going to, he, he's doing everything he can to help David, his friend. They had a, a tremendously wonderful, positive godly friendship and you see the words he strengthened it's like he strengthened his faith in God he strengthened his trust in God he instead of trying to draw listen to the difference instead of trying to draw someone to ourselves where we're the need meter. The key is not to abandon the friendship because so many friendships start out positive. And then they, the unhealthiness within the individuals take over. It's like, I need you to need me. I need you to be, to, I need to be your all in all. But instead, in the Jonathan-David relationship, one strengthened his faith in God. I never will forget seeing that for the first time. And I, I'll admit, I liked being the answer person at times to help people. And I just grew up in a very painful, dysfunctional home where my dad had three families going on at the same time. And, you know, it's like, uh, and I was, I think I became my mother's, I 
felt very responsible for her. I, I, I was very concerned because dad was very, uh, he was not a Christian. He said, I'm not a Christian. I don't, you know, uh, I don't have to go by Christian ethics. And he had all these women and, you know, I, I hated him. Um, that's why I later needed to write a book, How to Forgive When You Don't Feel Like It, because I certainly did not feel like it. And it took a long time to figure it out. I needed to learn to let the Lord be my rock. To not let me try to be the need meter, try to take care of my two sisters and try to take care of my mom and just try to balance everything. I, I never thought about any of this until I started learning about codependency. And all of a sudden, I'm finding, oh, I am, I've got these some patterns here that are, that, that are wrong. The Bible says the Lord is my rock. But instead of trusting in ourselves to do things, we need to have our absolute trust, make sure it's placed where it needs to be. Biblical dependency means God wants you to depend on him, to totally rely on him, not on people, not on things or self-effort, to believe that he will meet all your needs. Biblical dependency means to trust him to take care of your loved ones. Because you can say, but, 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 I, but I love this person. I can't abandon. Listen, if they are so dependent on you, for example, I'm thinking about someone where I kept trying to help this person come to Christ. And I kept trying to meet the needs, kept trying to meet the needs. She kept looking to me, all this stuff. And finally... I realized I was a stumbling block. If I could meet all her needs, why would she need God? If you try to meet all of another person's needs, that person doesn't need God. You can be a stumbling block not meaning to, not even thinking about it that way. You are not God. And he knows it, and you know it. So don't act like you can meet all of that person's needs. You trust him to take care of your loved ones, and sometimes that means you have to move away for a period of time. It may be permanently. But let him be the one they turn to. God wants you to rely on Christ to overcome destructive dependencies. Each person needs to emphasize the other's strengths and encourage the other to overcome personal weaknesses. It's not you overcoming the personal weaknesses. It encourages the other person to be dependent on the Lord while being responsive to the needs of other people. Notice... Uh, Philippians 2, 4 says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. But be sure when you're looking to the interests of others, you're not taking the place that God alone should have. Don't allow yourself to be another person's God, and you need to communicate if you think it's too much, too much on you. By the way, it's, very, it's a compliment if people... Are drawn to you and you feel here's this person who's so dependent on you and initially it feels good you're a savior no there's only one savior and you are not him get it God's heart is to break the pattern of codependency recognizing the lies you have believed and replace them with God's truth God's truth what are, what's God's truth? I need people I can trust and depend on to feel good about myself versus I need to put my trust and confidence completely in the Lord. I need the approval of others to feel good about myself versus I need to desire the approval of God. Codependent people typically appear capable and self-sufficient but in reality they can feel insecure self-doubting and in need of approval 
I'm going to give you a few of the characteristics. These are all written in our material, the need to be needed. I try to fix someone else's problems, even to my own detriment. I do things for others that they are capable of doing themselves. I feel upset when my help isn't wanted. I judge myself more harshly than I judge others. I feel guilty when I stand up for myself. I feel good about giving, but have difficulty receiving. I look for my worth and the approval of someone close to me. I say no when I should say yes, and say yes when I should say no. I have difficulty setting boundaries with others. I become defensive about my relationship with this person. I feel stuck in this significant relationship. I feel used and taken advantage of by someone else. I plan my life around someone close to me, like having difficulty making other plans, even though there's nothing wrong with it. I prioritize my relationship with another person over my relationship with the Lord. Those are some of the characteristics. And a codependent relationship profile means typically denial. Nope, that's not me. They're in denial about it. They have difficulty establishing healthy, intimate relationships. Yes, they can have a relationship, but somehow it gets messy or sticky or there's control or it's just not, not free to be the person you are led by God to be. Difficulty setting boundaries, struggle with an addiction other than the relationship addiction. Could be food, whatever. False sense of security. Jealous and possessiveness would characterize at least one of the two. Controlling and manipulative, at least with one of the two. Um, low self-worth, violating their own consciences, extreme ups and downs, and fear of abandonment, loss of personal identity. Now, this is a big deal. I've heard people say, I, I feel like I'm not me anymore. I've become a chameleon. I, tr I, 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 what do you want me to be? Okay, if you want me to be brown, I'll be brown. You want me to be gray, I'll be gray. If you want me to be green, I'll be green. I, I, green. What, what, what do you want from me? I, I, I'll, I'll morph. No, that's not God's intention. Feeling entrapped in the relationship. I find more bitter than death the person who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. Where does codependency come from? It is rooted in childhood pain. Past pain impacting today's choices. Codependent people are grown-ups who have never matured emotionally, regardless of what their age is. The Bible refers to immature grown-ups as infants feeding on milk instead of on solid food. And you see this in this passage in Hebrews 5. But going on, in childhood development, God gives parents the major responsibility of nurturing their children so they will not be love-starved an emotional state of setting them up to look for love in all the wrong places. Love starved, like a hole in a bucket. I'll talk about that in a minute. There are these five stages of development. Helpless babies, pushing away toddlers, conflict with young children. I want it my way. Uh, independent uh, pre-adolescence. Uh, later, adolescents begin learning sharing. But emotionally needy children who never learn healthy interdependence in turn become codependent adults addicted to unhealthy relationships because they never learn to think as healthy adults. 
In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In your thinking, be adults. So this is going to take a change of thinking on your part. What causes repeated cycles of codependency? Because this is where, well, I thought, I thought, you know, I had this with this person over here. Now I find myself stuck in this relationship, and they're, they're, they're not the same, but, but there are similarities. Romans 7, 7, uh, Romans 7, 19 says, I do not the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Hmm. This I keep on doing. By the way, that chapter doesn't end there. It's close to the end. There are some who say, well, I'm just a Paul person. I had a man one, several times. I've had men on the radio. I'm just a Roman 7 kind of guy. You know, I, I do a lot of good things. I, I just have this over here. And I said, oh, and so it's justifying. Oh, because I do good, it's like the good outweighs the bad. But, but you know, yeah, I know I've got a problem over here. But, but look at all the good. I said, well, have you read the end of the chapter? What? Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. It's Jesus Christ, my Lord. He will, He's my rescuer. He is the true Savior. Instead of one trying to be the Savior of the other, uh-uh. No, you don't need to get your emotional needs met through an unhealthy dependence. So what childhood setup leads to an adult addiction? Let's consider, as children, their love buckets were empty. Their love buckets were empty. Children may become love addicts because they didn't receive enough positive information as children. They grew up feeling unloved, insignificant, and insecure by a major parent who wasn't there giving it, uh, experienced traumatic separation or a lack of bonding. So children may become love addicts because they felt continued and, and continue to feel this intense sadness and profound loss as a result of being abandoned. They were repeatedly rejected by a parent, at least one, felt and continue to feel extreme fear and helplessness and emptiness. So what childhood setup leads to this adult love addiction? As adults, they find their love buckets have holes in them. Now, you're going to hold this right up here. Here's a bucket, right? Got a good bucket here. So what happens if you've got a love bucket, but it's got holes in it? Okay, look at the magic here. It doesn't hold water. It doesn't hold sand. It isn't performing what a bucket is supposed to do. Didn't he do a great job? Give him a hand. Yay! Okay. And by the way, I got to thinking about this not long ago, and I'm only going to do a part of this, but I, some of you may know that there's a song. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, a hole. Then fix it, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry. Then fix it, dear Henry, dear Henry, fix it. And so what you find is, with what shall I fix it, dear Liza, dear Liza? Um, straw. Uh, with, uh, straw. But the straw is too long. Then cut it, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry. Uh, well, with uh, what? With a knife. The knife is too dull. Then sharpen it, dear Henry. Uh, on what? Shall I sharpen it? On a stone. The stone is too dry. Then wet it. With what shall I wet it? With water. In what shall I fetch it? Uh, in a bucket. Well, there's a hole in my bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. There's a hole in my bucket. So it just keeps going around and around and around. You understand? There's no solution. So, what we've got to do is figure out 
What helps fill the love bucket? And what do we do when we're in a destructive relationship like this? Because these children believe being loved by someone or just anyone is a solution for their emptiness. Enter, they enter into relationships believing they cannot take care of themselves. They assign much too much power to the other person in the relationship. And these children as adults are still emotionally needy children. They have unrealistic expectations the other, of the other person. They try to stick like glue to the other person to feel connected. They live in fear that those who truly love them will ultimately leave them. I'm going to go to the root cause. The root cause, page number 66. By the way, the, the Bible says the man who fears God will avoid all extremes, Ecclesiastes 7, 18. So the issue is not fearful that I'm going to be abandoned. You realize when you come into a life-changing relationship with Christ, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. My favorite scripture, because I have abandonment issues, um, just the bizarre, if you grow up in a bizarre home, you know, and, and, and my greatest fear was that I would be abandoned. And, and I've known, and where I have made mistakes in relationships, it's, it's this area. It's not, I said the three inner needs were love, significance, and security. I've always struggled with the sense of feeling truly secure until I finally have realized, no, um, he is my security. My favorite verse in the Bible is Deuteronomy 31.8. Deuteronomy 31.8. If you're taking notes, put that down, and especially if you have had a struggle in this area. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Every day for the next three months, just personalize this. This is Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord himself goes before me and will be with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. I will not be afraid. I will not be discouraged. That's using the word of God, applying it personally to your own life. The root cause of codependency, usually it's expecting or demanding that another person meet all of our needs. I need to be connected to a stronger person who will provide me with a sense of love and emotional security. But the right to believe for the dependent is God often expresses his love through others, but he doesn't want me to live my life depending on another person. I need to live dependently on Jesus who will meet my needs and give me healthy relationships and make my life fruitful. You know, you think, well, I don't know. I, I, have, I, I still don't always feel significant. Well, you're so significant. I'm going to share this. You, you're so significant that he said, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That is extraordinary. He's already pre-planned what your future can be maximized to be, whether you're starting right now, just like you, honey. You're starting right where you are, and he's got a plan for you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the past has been. He already knows what he's planned for you. That's um, Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. So, the primary issue with, in, with codependency is, I'm going to use a term that I don't like, is idolatry, which means giving greater pi priority to a person than to God himself. So let me give you the scripture that really helped me. Um, and this is number 76. The key verse to memorize for many people, and for me, that really helped me was, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? 
If I were still trying to please people, I would not be the servant of Christ. Don't live for the approval of someone else. You're going to be criticized. You know that. Jesus said, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. If they hate me, they'll, hurt, they'll hate you. So expect that there are going to be people who are going to be against you. And it, it, the Bible even says we are called to suffer. So it's not even getting all wrapped up in what other people are saying. Um, a way to, to do this, um, you know, we, we have this, um, it, it's called a, the freedom formula, uh, number 78, a freedom formula. It's a new purpose, a new priority, and a new plan. The new purpose is I'll do whatever it takes to be conformed to the character of Christ. I'll do whatever it takes to be conformed to the character of Christ. That's Romans 8, 29. You are predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Wow, predestined. He's already pre-planned how he's going to be conforming you more and more to the character of Christ. So you say, I'll do, okay, I've got this negative relationship. I, I know it's sticky, but, but there's some good about it too. But I'm not helping that other person if I'm in a codependent relationship. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to be conformed to the character of character of Christ. Number two, a new priority means um, I will line up my thinking with God's thinking. So if I'm trying to win the approval of other people, I've, I've got to stop it. Um, a new priority. I'll line up my thinking with God's thinking. New plan. By the way, notice it's a new purpose, a new priority, a new plan equals a transformed life. That's the bullseye in the middle. Part of the plan, and I can only have time to tell you a part of the plan, I will confront the consequences of my codependency. At times, I'm not being a friend to the other person in my life, to this other person. I will confront my, emotion, my painful emotions. I will confront my secondary addictions. I will confront my current codependent relationship. You've got to deal with this. I will confront my codependent focus. I just have to have you in my life. I have to have you. It's like, it's like you're the most important. I, I can't live without you. I will confront my codependent conflicts. I will confront my codependent responses. I will confront what I need to leave in order to receive. I'm going to say it again. I will confront what I need to leave in order to receive. I just want to say, if you have a hole in your bucket, it's great for you to know it now so you can allow the Lord to fill it. Heavenly Father, how we thank you. Thank you that you know us intimately. You know every part of our hearts. You know what's broken, regardless of what we look like to others. But most of all, you're the healer. Heal us, O oh Lord, and we will be healed. Save us and you will be saved. Save us and we will be saved because you're the only true Savior. May we look to you to meet our emotional needs and to learn how to be whole. To learn how to be whole in our relationship with you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for your perfect plan for us and that we can fit into that plan. In your holy name we pray. Amen.